Hey guys, welcome to Twin Flicks, a film channel for film lovers like yourself. Today we welcome uh, award-winning film composer and editor John Ottman, and today we'll be talking to him about his newest film, Bohemian Rhapsody, which is in theaters now. So I want to thank you, John, for taking time out of your busy schedule to talk with us today. Sure. It's not so busy right now. Just relaxing. <laughs> Taking some time off after the <laughs> editing. Doing stuff like this, yeah. <laughs> First thing everybody thinks of when they think of Bohemian Rhapsody is the controversy, the, the elephant in the room, was the controversy of Brian Singer. Uh, a lot of people know that Brian was fired um, from Fox, at least according to reports, Brian was uh fired from Fox, and then Dexter Flexer was brought in for the last two weeks of shooting. Uh, a lot of people have asked me personally, and also I've seen it all over social media, I mean, it's just all over the place, um, how much of the film is actually Brian Singer's compared to Dexter Flex Fletcher? Well, um, basically, Dexter came in for the last couple of weeks of shooting, and, uh, and then uh, hung around for about uh, four weeks in post and then left. And so I was sort of, the film was left to me and uh, to see through to the end with, um, and I worked with Graham King and uh, Dennis O'Sullivan, his co-producer. Co um, and it was basically the three of us seeing the film through to the end. Okay. So did, um, I heard report that Newton Thomas Siegel also stepped in to direct a few scenes. Is that correct? I mean, you know, it's something that, that it's, it's really, like you said, the elephant in the room. That's, it's not something that, that uh, you know, we, we like to dwell on only because, like you said, it's not fair to the movie and, and all the people um, who, who really stepped up because of the belief in the film and it was a labor of love for everyone um, to see this film through. You know, so whether it was me or or uh, Tom Siegel, the DP, or or uh, the co-producer Dennis O'Sullivan, any or you know anyone, uh, the actors, of course, it, it's really um, it's it's it, this weird situation is is a disservice to everyone who really killed mm -hmm. themselves to bring this to the screen. You know, despite you know to 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 transcend the drama. You know, exactly, and you you can tell. I mean, when you see this film, you can tell it was a labor of love, and and everybody just put forth their their A game. I mean. It's just yeah. I mean, I mean everyone uh, really believed in it, so it's uh, you know, and uh, I was you know was joking that I, I I told Brian after Apocalypse that this you know doing the scoring and editing thing is something that I couldn't do to myself anymore in terms of doing both jobs, and so because I originally was supposed to score and edit Bohemian Rhapsody, mm -hmm. and um, and then the irony of course uh, this came about, and I'm like, how do you freaking say no to this? And so. I, I said yes, and um, even though the pay was crap, and I had to go to London for a year, and then of course I ended up not writing the score because I didn't think it was right. So it was a huge sacrifice for me to not even um, to spend a year of my life not even uh, getting a film score out there. So well, I mean, the editing in this film honestly just beautifully done. The pacing and momentum is perfect. Um, Simon, my brother, and I were watching the film in the theater, and we, we kept nudging each other, saying, "Wow, the editing is just great in this." Oh, um, thanks for noticing. <laughs> oh, sure. Uh, you said you spent a year in London. Is that about how long it took to to edit the film? No, well, well, in a sense, yeah, because um, I start cutting the moment we start shooting, and um, and so from the point of shooting to um, the final dub was about about a year. Um, yeah, and, and the first thing we shot was Live Aid, so I basically would tinker on that any any spare time I had while I was trying to put the film together. Did the editing, I'm sure, you know, editing changes while you're in um, post with, with films all the time. Um, was there like a huge amount of changes in the editing from when, while you're editing while I was shooting compared to post? Well, um, everything's always in flux, and you're always rearranging uh, scenes uh, in films and so forth. And then, of course, in a large part of filmmaking, unfortunately, is politics and and uh, and dealing with uh, you know the studio and, and different opinions and test screenings and um, and those are the 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 other. 
uh, things you have to navigate while you're trying to be creative and make a movie. So um, it can be very, very agonizing, very infuriating, very, lots of tossing and turning in bed, lots of being pissed off at people, <laughs> anticipating some dumb thing they're going to make you do, even though they may ne never even do it. You know, so, but I would say that, that basically the structure of the film did not change from the original cut, with the exception of um, the first act, because the, the, I guess the biggest challenge, one of the biggest challenges was to, was to get the story on, get the band's story on, on, on its way. Um, and get the Mary Freddie uh, relationship established economically in the film and, and get on with things, even though it's a double edged sword because, in one regard, you know, uh, their journey, you know, has been criticized that it's, it's too fast and too easy, and I completely agree with that. At the same time, we, f we found that if, if we dwelled on too many stumbling blocks um, in the first act, that it, it, it dragged it dragged the film getting into the into the into the stuff where they're on their they're on their way. So um, that was that was a hard thing to to shuffle in the beginning to sort of have the film have momen momentum without feeling like we're cheating their their rise, you know. And um, I, I don't know. You know, there, you know, there's always some extra things I wish we could, we could have left in, but um, I think there was still, uh, you know, um, there's always a paranoia on, especially the studio's part, that the audiences are gonna are not gonna run out of theater when they're like bored for five seconds, you know. So, <laughs> um, uh, you know, one one thing that always interests me about, <clears throat> excuse me, about editing is how much freedom does the editor actually have with the film? Like, how much freedom did you have with the film to experiment with? Um, well, and this one a lot, because I was kind of left alone. But, <laughs> but, but, uh, but having said that, you know, on other films I've done with Brian, you know, for instance, for me, it's, I, well, to answer that question, it's different with every editor, because it really depends on the editor's relationship with, that, with the director they're working for. You know, uh, some directors, if they've had a long track record with an, uh, an editor, will... You know, you know, want that editor to sort of just do his thing, and and um, and other other directors are basically sitting there, and are and the direct and the editor is simply you know hands, you know. So um, with Brian, he he sort of said over the years he doesn't want to um, uh, sort of destroy uh, an idea I might be you know having in my head by by influencing me in some way. So he, when we finish shooting, he likes to go away for a while and let me just put the film together so we can come back and react to it because he wants to be surprised by something that I do. And, you know, the way he puts it is if, he, if he's moved, you know, by it, then um, he'll throw out any preconceived notions he had about what it was supposed to be. So I've, I've been lucky in, in, in that regard is to sort of been able to do my thing, you know, and have the freedom to do that, which, you know, when you have that freedom, you don't, and you don't feel like there's a, you know, um, the Gestapo behind you or something, you're just much more creative, you know. Yeah, it gives you, gives you more breathing room. Yeah, well, it's empowering, too. It makes you more enthusiastic about what you're doing, you know. And, and even, even, even though I had the freedom, too, uh, there's the, still the studio aspect and so forth. And I, I, I've said in other interviews, like, you know, there were sections of this film that I was sure were going to be blown apart by, by some executive, you know, pointing a gun at it, you know, and because um, oh, there's always those precious moments you just pray are going are, are, are gonna, to uh, stay the way they are, and um, for me, one of those sequences was um, when they're putting the, the song together in, in, the, in, the, in the country barn um, studio, bow rap, putting bow rap together, and um, that was largely put together from actors doing a lot of improv, and I scripted it out in the editing room, and I was really proud of it, and literally was three quarters of the way through it and I was already pissed off if they were going to destroy it so I, I was like that editing in anger you know but, um, but I was really surprised every test screening we had every, every time we screened for the studio that never got touched ever so it never didn't change a frame from my original cut so there are a few sections like that in this movie that, 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 that um, got, got, uns you know, got through unscathed <laughs> so. oh, wow and it also, and so, and so, and so when, and so when those those sections got preserved and so forth, that just increased my enthusiasm for what I was doing because I, you know, I felt like everyone was on board and, and you know, despite, you know, creative differences with the studio and so forth, we basically, in the end of the day, got our way. You know. Yeah, that's good. I mean, it helps a lot when you know everybody is is working together for the benefit of the film instead of. You know, these executives want one thing. You want another thing. The director wants another thing. Yeah. It's you know when when you have a situation like you like with Bohemian Rhapsody, it, it makes it a lot more 
I guess you feel a lot more freedom that, okay, I can relax and do what I imagine in my head of the film could, should look like. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there were certain things I still wish were in the film, and that always is the case. I mean, there's a misconception, too. The editors always want things short and fast, which is not the case. I mean, I think editors are storytellers, and they're passionate about the story they're telling, and and they and oftentimes, more than not, they, they want to to keep things in the movie and, and, and have certain areas breathe. Um, and I was, you know, I was probably 90% successful. Now, you can never get 100% of what you want. So, um, you know, there were a couple of moments in Zanzibar as Freddy as a kid, and we went back and forth on that. I was always a big advocate, but, you know, you can't get everything. But at the end of the day, Graham and I, the producer in the film, um, you know, we, despite all the things that, that could have happened, we feel very happy about what we got, we got, we got in the movie. <laughs> so, because there was, there was, you know, lots of battles back and forth about wanting to slash and burn sections, and um, we really stuck to our guns, and, and like I said, we, we got away with most of what we wanted. Nice, yeah. Well, I mean, there's a few moments in the film that I wanted to bring up. One in particular that we just love is the scene where Freddie Mercury is standing outside of the farm, and he's looking over the scenery, and you very subtly mm-hmm. hear the piano beginning to the mm-hmm. piano theme of Rhapsody. Yeah. I played background. that. <laughs> oh, you played that? Yeah. Oh, nice. I didn't so, compose it, though, of course, yeah. You can't, you can't take credit for the song, huh? No, no. <laughs> um, but, man, that's just a beautiful scene, and I've, we've oh, seen thanks. the movie three times already, and oh, we're wow. gearing up for that for that one scene. <laughs> it, oh, that's just great. Something about it I just love. Um, well, was that particular scene, was that something that was pinned in the script? Or no. That, um, well, no, I can't, I can't say no. No, he, he was supposed to walk outside and, and, um, and then go in that house. And um, originally he goes in the house and, you know, it's much longer and he sees a, some grandfather clock and, he, and then he sees, he, he looks at some pictures and looks himself in the mirror and then he walks into the room and finds the piano. So all that was cut out, of course. That was ma- massive shoe leather. But, but, um, but yeah, basically that was the idea. He goes from the, the kitchen argument and, go, and uh, walks outside and, and um, goes in the house to play the piano. Yeah. But, but I extend, I mean, there was never the idea of looking out over the countryside and, and hearing the piano. I, I just, I wanted to protract. Here's another, here's another example of, of, of editors don't make things short, but they want to protract moments. And so I wanted like, more of that. I wanted to build to the moment where we cut to him cut, playing, uh, you know, bow rap on the piano in there. So I, I found this second unit shot that was panning the countryside. Of course, the DP was horrified I used that shot because it wasn't intended to be used as a cutaway. POV shot because technically there is no countryside in front of him. It's like some road or a barn or something. But I'm like, I didn't know what the geography was. I wasn't there. So to me, there's just uh, there's some hills in front of him. So I used that shot and and um, I thought it was a really beautiful shot and that allowed me the time to build build to that moment in the piano by by pre lapping the, the the Bohemian in its head. Yeah, it's it's like I said, it's such a it's a brief scene, but it's just. Uh, it's just beautiful. I, I just love the way it, it was it was done. Um, and again, like I said, with the with the piano subtle in the background, building up to the moment when when he uh, plays a song. Yeah. Um, another scene that always gets a huge laugh in a the theater, um, and that's again with the barn, and it's the close up of the rooster, and yeah. he's just about to crow, and then the chorus Galileo comes is overdubbed over it. It yeah, always gets a great laugh. It gets a huge laugh, and that, that, that that's that whole sequence that was very that was very precious to me, and uh, that you know all that putting putting together blow wrap in the barn. Was that something that you that you thought of on the moment of editing? They shot all the second unit stuff of of um, you know animals um, in in the in the bar in the, uh, in the in the farm, I guess it were, and um, that rooster. Um, originally had a, an appearance earlier on when they first arrived, and that, that was cut out. Um, and then um, it sort of comes com- comes back walking along the wall. And I don't remember whether that was part of the plan to pre-lap that, but I but it was such an obvious thing for me to do. <laughs> so, and like you said, it, it, it is one of the biggest laughs in the movie. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's just little. It's just all these little scenes like that, all these little fun moments that that really make the film. Um, come to life it makes it more personal to to the audience i I think beginning of this interview you said that you uh were originally hired to compose the music as well as edit so and i noticed there was no credit for a composer so there was really no no score at all Um, well there was credit and i oh but i took it out (laughs) (laughs) 
you know, when I, I, you know, I, I designed that whole opening title sequence, and um, you know, originally my name was on there twice, as it always is, because I always, I always end up doing the score, and I, I, and so when I was putting that title sequence together, I, of course, I put it in there, assuming that everyone, everyone kept telling me more than I believed myself that there was going to be a score in this film, you know, because you know, it's always underscore for a biopic, no matter if it's a band movie or not, la la la. And I was like, I don't know. It always felt wrong to me because I felt like it should be just the, the goal should be to keep it pure and to not pollute it with typical film music, you know, and to make it melodramatic and so forth. But, um, but you know, everyone was like, well, yeah, but it's inevitable. It's going to happen. There's gonna, it's going to need support. So, anyways, I put my name in there. But then, as we as we started making the movie, it really dawned on me even further, and, and especially with Graham King, that the producer that. Um, it would just be the wrong thing to do, and so I found other ways of supplementing where, where there was dry areas. Um, so where he was alone, like um, you know, when he makes a phone call to Mary, you know, with the light scene, and also the light, the light switching on and off scene, and also when he proposes to Mary, I just put uh, opera in the background because Freddie Mercury did listen to opera a lot. So that that helped um, move those scenes and not doing it in a typical way, but do it in a sort of organic way to the movie. And then I also used some of the Queen songs to score um, sequences, like um, when he goes and gets his diagnosis, I used sort of the orchestra tracks from Who Wants to Live Forever um, from the Highlander score. So that, that really it was born out of a song that, that, you know, is in the film there. And then I just sort of then took the, the vocal tracks out and, um, and then continued scoring the scene with the song. It just makes it much more intelligent and organic to the movie. Yeah, I mean, this, the, the film is, you know, of course, it's, a, it has, it's about Freddie Mercury, his life, but it's also a lot about Queen themselves, the band itself. Right, right. And so, you know, when thinking about if, if keeping the music from Queen as the score continue really um, solidifies that as this is a Queen movie um, and it doesn't get like as you said melodramatic or things like that um, right. using the, the, the Queen music um, again talking about the opening scene I mean we love the opening title sequence um, again was, was that your design, or was it, or was it penned like that in, in a script? That was, or? No, well, it wasn't. It wasn't penned out. However, there, these shots were shot with the intention of using for some, using them for some opening title sequence. No one knew what it was going to be. I didn't even know what it was going to be. So they just went out and shot a bunch of stuff. And, um, and so, and so I just used it to obviously to, to, to design the sequence. I mean, him, him waking up in bed was absolutely intended to be used in this, in the sequence. Um, and, um, I loved how he was right in the middle of the frame so I could put the, the Bohemian, Bohemian Rhapsody right, right, right across his shoulders, which, um, worked perfectly. That was not planned, but I just, I would just discover that that worked great. And I loved keeping it completely silent, you know, um, until he kind of moves his head, and that's why I brought him the cue, or the cue, the the song, <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, and then and then just arranged all the pieces. But yeah, there, there was there was a there was an intention to use that stuff, you know. Okay, <clears throat> excuse me. All right, so um, yeah, now did uh, did Brian May or Roger Taylor have any kind of input in the editing process at all, or did they contribute of what they how they wanted scenes to flow, or, or not really the dramatic scenes. Um, they 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 had um, consultation rights to see the film, and they had full authority to make any uh, comments they wanted to on the on the the scenes other than the concerts. But they really um, honed in on the concert scenes, and it was really just that, uh, their their comments were really just about you know. Uh, did you have to cut that much out? <laughs> so, you know, because, it, but, but they did understand, you know, uh, that it was a movie and they did, they fully understood that the songs could not be played in their entirety, you know, for each of these con these little concerts in the movie. So they totally understood, but it was, and so I, as a composer, would, would, would try to do the best I could to make the edit seamless and not feel like we were cheated, um, out of the best of the songs. But Brian May would have his point of view, you know, on a couple places I would cut and we would either open in those places up, or I would I would cut in a different place. But but um but and, and, and the, the funny thing is is like 
a lot of the places to edit the music would be in the fill sections, which were guitar solos. <laughs> you know, so I had to cringe every time I would find a, a great place to cut would be during a Brian May solo. And if he would come in, I would just like, you know, be sweating bullets and he was going to just, you know, uh, have a, you know, fly off the handle. But, but he, he got it. He understood. So, but he did have me open up a few moments and, and so forth. You know, having said that, we're, we're, you know, I'm pretty happy with, how they were cut down. Um, I, I, there was sections of live that I wish we could have opened up more. Um, and uh, but um, I'm happy to say that for the for the for the fans of the film, especially Queen fans, they're I just finished working on an ex extended version of Live Aid, which is the full 20 minute set. So um, it's the two songs that were cut out and all the little parts of the other songs that were that were truncated, um, including two. Two plus minutes I removed from um, um, Radio Gaga, which killed me. Um, so it's going to be—it's really going to be a treat, I think, to for people to see the full version. Oh wow, that's great! I can't wait to see that. Um, yeah, so because I know I believe little thing called Love was cut out. In yeah, crazy little thing like yeah, because um, a lot of Alex's um, insane gyrations on the stage and so forth were casualties of the stuff I had to cut out of, of Love Live Aid for the film version. So um, it'll be nice to release that. I don't know how they're going to release it, whether it's a standalone thing or not, but, but they're going to do it. They spent like a million bucks on visual effects, so they're going to release it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It'd be nice if they, if they included it in the film instead of a you know, separate That's extra. Actually, I thought it's cool if they did uh, you know, your option to watch the film with full Live Aid at the end or the, one, the film version, but again, I don't know what they're going to do. Of course, I would love them to eventually... I would love to eventually work on extended version of the movie itself, but um, and maybe they would do that. There's no plans, I don't think, to do that now. But I guess if the film made like you know a billion dollars, they might they would do that, you know. Yeah. yeah. Now, of course, as we talked about, music plays such a. Of course, it's a Queen movie, so it, music plays such a pivotal role in the film. Um, how much were you involved in deciding what songs would be used and where to play them at? Well, I was. I'm, I was very influential in, in, in into where they're going to play and so forth, but I wasn't. I, I wasn't. It was. A, I didn't have any uh, say really in what songs we we're going to use because that was pretty much scripted. Um, I did attempt to use in some of the scripted song. Some of the intentions of the script were not done because it just didn't work. You never know. So, for instance, over the proposal scene, it was scripted that we were going to play. Um, um, my best friend, uh, that song, and and I, I tried that many many different ways and just never worked. It felt very frivolous, and so I, I didn't use it. So, uh, but 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 I would say the majority of the songs uh, that were used were scripted. Yeah, you know? I mean it wasn't scripted how they were used. <laughs> I mean I'd, I'd, I had to design all of those sequences. There was no there was no uh, you know the script didn't say how they're going to be designed or used because I felt I, I found that when I was when I was in, uh, using the songs in the film that when they just would have a straight concert it was actually as amazing as the music is um, it was not involving because right. once you start a narrative story once you light that fuse of a, nar of a narrative story and, and you start and you suddenly have a concert I found that you have to continue that story going so I I just found that if I, I had to tell a story in each of these concerts, for instance, in Fat Bottom Girls concert, they're touring America, so the, st the one story is them yelling out the cities and so forth, which kind of creates a story going on within the concert, and then also him at the truck stop, seeing the trucker um, go in the restroom and, and sort of uh, having, having a glimpse into him questioning his sexuality. So that was the story of that song, you know, and then... Um, uh, another one bites the dust. The story is, you know, him going into the CD bar and so forth, which is a scene that we had cut from the film, and I used that footage to tell a story for that. And that's what I found that I had to, I had to continue a narrative, no matter what I, how I, I had to apply a narrative to all these songs. So uh, how, I mean, is it? Do you just have like sleepless nights <laughs> when you're trying to edit a film like this, trying to figure out how to piece things together where they make sense, where they flow right? Yeah, um, it's mainly sleepless nights. It, it, I'm a warrior, so I, I get that from my mom, I think. I just have a worry gene I can never get rid of, so I toss and turn a lot and worry about everything. You know, um, are they going to destroy this scene? You know, how is this going to go together? How is this going to work? Is Live Aid ever going to work? You know, um, but, but yeah, I mean, um, lots of sleeplessness and trying to figure out how to, how to 
condense uh, and, and tell a person's life story as well, or ba the band's story. Because you know, biopics are are difficult because you 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 have an, someone's entire life you have to boil down to two hours, you know. And on top of it, it has to be uh, it, this movie had to be entertaining and a celebration of Queen, um, its music and Freddie. So it's sort of I had a lot of things I had to sort of get across in two hours, you know. Or to, to or whatever the time was going to be, but you know whether in the the confines of the runtime of a film, you know, the the whole film just felt really fun and enjoyable to to watch. I mean, I we had a smile on my face <laughs> through the entire film, and uh, as soon after yeah, I saw it the first time, I immediately wanted to go back and see it again. Good. I mean, I'm finding that that's the case for a lot of people. They want to see it again. And I, most people I've talked to have seen it twice already, which is great. And, you know, it's funny because I worked on many movies and, you know, I've seen it. I can't even count the number of times I've seen this film. And it never gets old for some reason for me. I, I watch it. I'm not bored. Um, and I've seen it probably a hundred times. So cause I took a friend to see it the other day, cause, you know, and it's like, I wasn't bored. <laughs> so, you know, it's, um, it's, it's, such, it's just the power of, I mean, sure, my work, but also the power of just a great ensemble, um, some great dialogue, and obviously great music, you know. So I want to get to a little bit of Live Aid. Um, how much freedom did you have in deciding how to edit all the concert footage and piece it together? A complete freedom. I, it was sort of like, here you go. <laughs> it's like, it's like, holy crap, you know. Um, I, I won't say I had many iterations of it, but I did have, uh, you know, a, my original version of it was um, obviously longer and had a lot more crowd shots. And every time I cut to a crowd, it's like fifty thousand dollars because it's all CGI. So um, there was. So once I, I presented it, then you know came the, the the pragmatic issues of cutting of cutting the budget down uh, of the visual effects budget. And so I had to uh, find ways of of, um, of cutting out shots and staying this you know on the, the plain front angle of the stage, which I I didn't prefer doing because um, a lot of the dynamic shots are from the side or behind Freddie and you know and are twirling around him and so forth and and you're inevitably going to see the see the the, the the empty parking lot out there which was what, what it was you know so um, but but what came of it was was almost like a really great evolution for the scene because I had to cut out some of the visual effect shots I'd planned that I decided to stay on the stage for the first third of it, you know, more, and then and then the second third of it kind of start opening up and 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 showing more of the audience. And by the time we were at the, the last third, it's full on audience participation. So it really gave it a good evolution. Hmm. So do you know how many special effect shots uh, ended up in the final cut? I I have no clue as to how many there were. A lot more than were originally budgeted. <laughs> so. I think you know how you set you, you you sell a sequence by getting the you get the, free, the you, get, you get the film greenlit by saying oh you know um, you know we only use pipe like you know forty shots you know and um, and so the, the film gets greenlit and of course ends up being you know four hundred shots or something or maybe six hundred shots I don't know but but um, it was you know it was it was an extra few million we spent on what was budgeted for um, visual effects because um, I think the the premise of getting the film greenlit was that we're all going to stay on the stage and never really see the audience, which of course is insane because because the whole cornerstone of Queen's music is the audience participation. So I found that that when I brought up the audio of the audience and and, and showed them that the, the emotional factor just just skyrocketed, you know. Yeah, definitely. You know, the the set design, especially in Live Aid, is I found so detailed because I after seeing the film, I I went on YouTube and found the actual concert and watched it. And then the next day I saw the movie again, and, I mean, I noticed that, that even how they placed the Pepsi cups on Freddie's piano was exactly how they were placed in the real footage. Was it difficult to keep the continuity? I don't think it was difficult to keep the continuity once the set, the set was built. I mean, it was basically built in reference to the Live Aid concert, and once those, those, those uh, elements were put into place... Um, I was just free to do whatever I wanted editorially because it was done. I mean, the, the cups were in their place. So, and then from there on, I didn't really want to adhere uh, to the original Live Aid 
because, uh, you know, why just do the same thing? That this was sort of live aid as, you, as you've never seen it, like, you know, as if you were there on the stage or different angles you've never seen before or closer to Freddy, la, la, la. So I think that that, that was the whole premise is like um, not only the emotional factor of, of, of the story, live aid, but also just experiencing it differently. Otherwise, just watch the video, you know. Yeah, exactly. So we, we are almost out of time. Before we go, um, we do have a few viewer questions, if you don't mind taking. Okay. Um, Leroy Green 85 he asks, uh, was it very intimidating recreating John Williams' classic Superman theme for Superman Returns? <laughs> Well, it was extremely intimidating, in, 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 but not, not the theme. I used his theme, so, so that wasn't the intimidating part because I just used it verbatim, um, which I wanted to from the very beginning. The intimidating part was um, writing a, the score to the film, which had to live up to his Superman scores, you know, or score, I should say. Um, you know, I mean, literally, I was practically getting death threats before the movie started. Like, why is... Why is this guy writing the score. Why isn't it John Williams? You know, because this was the first Superman film, not these all these other films that have come out now where, where it's accepted it's not John Williams. Um, so, um, and I, I was really, I've told the story before, but I was very crippled by it creatively at first because I was so terrified of any, any just writing a note, you know, about getting, you know, a letter bomb sent to me or something. So, but I just, um, and, and, and I would be one of those people sending the letter bomb because, because, because his score of Superman is one of the greatest scores he ever wrote. Um, but what I did is I finally just said, fuck it. I'm just going to do what I would do naturally, be me. Um, and I, I grew up with John Williams' scoring sensibilities anyway. So I'm just, I probably was going to handle him in the same way. And, and, I, and so I just, it freed me up creatively just to, to write the score I would write by, and then and by infusing all of the, you know, the isms um, from his score into what I wrote. So the Isaiah Spencer Arnold, he asks, um, he says, what was it like working on so many great films with Brian Singer from X-Men to Bohemian? Well, it's um, weird. I'm such, I'm such a weird person because I, I don't really think about what I'm do I don't really think about the, what it is I'm doing. I'm just, I'm just in, I'm just in, in it doing it, if you know what I mean. It's like, it's like, um, when, for instance, we did Usual Suspects, and of course, we didn't know what we were doing at that point, like how big it was going to be and so forth, but, but, it, but it was our first, you know, quote-unquote big feature, but I just saw it as like, oh, we're just making another movie, and I'm cutting this little thing in my living room, I have no idea who these actors are, and I'm just going to treat them as characters, you know, and that's the way I kind of approach everything I do in a weird way, it's, um, you know, even if it's Superman, I'm like, okay, it's, well, you know, I can't say it about Superman, because it was, it was, there was such the pressure of, of, of the iconic 78 movie to sort of, sort of, uh, you know, uh, do it justice and not, not screw up that whole franchise and so forth. So there was, there was, I guess there was a big pressure on that one. But, um, I just sort of dive myself into the movie and forget, forget how big it, big it is, you know, or, or how, and, and I just do, do my thing, you know. I mean, half the time I don't even tell people I'm working on a film because I'm so, I, I, I'm just assuming that if I get fired or something or something terrible happens, I, I don't want to have to save face. So, but if I just don't tell anyone I'm working on the film, then, then everything's fine no matter what happens. I don't, you know, I, I, I don't have to ever admit I've worked on it. And then if it comes out and, and people love it, then I can say, oh, yeah, I worked on that, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. Yeah, I mean. You you can't go into into a working on a film thinking oh this is going to be you know make a billion dollars this is going to win all these awards uh, because it can affect the way you make the film. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the only time I probably thought about it was you know because I'm just not impressed when I meet celebrities. Only I'm impressed. You know what I mean? It's like you know I don't really they're just people, and so it's nice to sort of meet them and you work with them on a film it's no big deal but when someone's like world famous like Tom Cruise okay that was I did take note of that okay this is weird I'm talking to this guy I'm singing John Williams tunes with Tom Cruise so when I first met him that was that was bizarre because it's like someone is so famous you know what I mean but then after a while you know after a few weeks you just don't you're just like okay whatever you're just working with a person you know hmm. Uh, next question is Arvid Cat twenty seven ninety three asks um, first he says congrats on the film it's brilliantly ed brilliantly edited um, what's the difference between being a film editor and a sound editor well I mean film editor is the um, is uh, is the manager basically the entire movie and is, and is the storyteller both visu visu visually of course and well and and with sound and so forth and a sound editor works under 
uh, the, the director, I mean, I'm sorry, under the, um, well, under the, not two, but under the film editor. The sound editor basically is taking um, lots of sounds they find or, 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 or record and integrate them in, in help the sound designer create the, uh, the sound track to the film in terms of the, not the, not the music soundtrack, but the, the, the soundscape, in, in other words. I mean, a sound editor is going through and finding, you know, uh, the car horn for the car, that, you know, and so forth, or, or you know, uh, finding better car horns than the, than the editor was able to find. I mean, as the, as the editor of the film, and editor, every editor works differently, but I do a lot of the sound in the Avid myself, but it may not be, um, you know, the best choices. Like, you know, the, the dumbest example would be that car horn. You know, a car's going by, I put a beep beep in it, and, and then later the sound editor who's hired with, by the sound designer will, will endeavor to find maybe something better, you know. Mm. But, um, I don't know how to say that, but, 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 the, but, the, but the, you know, I would say that the, the, the film editor is the filmmaker, and the sound editor is basically someone who is helping uh, basically put together sound effects. You know. Okay. Uh, two more questions here. Um, Lee Jardina asks, um, how much do editors usually consult with the director on terms of how to set up the movie as a whole? Is it written in the script or do you go off base? It says here, example with Bohemian Rhapsody to start the film out with Live Aid, or is it the ed- editor's choice to mix it up? Um, in this particular sequence, um, the script did call for bookending Live Aid. But that is a good example because there are, you know, in more times than not, that would be a moment where the editor would have come up with that. You know, um, there's, there's, you know, many parts of the movie um, would be an example where, where, you know, the script never called for, um, you know, the chicken, the, 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 the rooster uh, joke, you know, or that, that, that's, a, that's a crazy little example, but, but um, or the script never called for telling these stories within the, uh, within the concerts, or the script never called for, you know, the certain scene, or scene rearrangements and so forth. But so um, I would say in a large portion of, of decisions, um, the editor is, make, is, is doing stuff that, were off, that are off script, yes. The film is rewritten in the editing room. That, that's been said by countless directors, and it's true, because you know, whatever is written in the script, I would say you know, a vast majority of it gets, gets rewritten, as, as it were, in the, in the, in edi- in the editing room. Yeah. yeah, sometimes you know you can have a film in mind, have it in the script, have it filmed, and then it comes out completely different in the editing. Yeah, yeah, because no matter how well you can imagine it in the, on the script, and even if you 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 faithfully reproduce that, there's a, there's an intangible thing where it suddenly, well, okay, that doesn't work, and you can't explain why, but it just doesn't, and so then you you make make it work for you make it work in the editing room uh, for for the film. Yeah. So our uh, last question here is from Rachel, the film nerd. Uh, she says many films use temp scores. As a composer and editor, do you view the use of a temp score differently? Um, I probably view it a little differently than, than, than composers, but I, I know every composer sees the, the, the need for it and the reasons for it. Um, as, as, a, as a filmmaker, I, I rely on it because I need to present the movie to the studio, and they need to know, um, first of all, the movie's got to fly for them, and so it has to have music in it. And secondly, it's my... It's my um, uh, way of, of, of showing them the kind of score that is being planned for the film. Um, so in that regard, it's very useful. But, but the, the, the bad part about film temp scores is that many times, you know, an editor is not necessarily musically inclined and will, and will just grab something and throw on a scene to sell the scene, to sell its cut, so to speak. The problem is that association immediately is established for the viewer and no one could ever imagine anything other than that thing he just happened to throw on there and that thing may be completely wrong for the movie or not the be- not the best choice but then the composer comes in and has to rip that thing off that really isn't the best thing for the film and so you have a score that really isn't a great score and then that score is tempted on another film and that composer has to rip that score off so every score an agent once told me that so many modern scores are the bastard childs of another score because um, you know, it, it, it's sort of like this, um, this constant ripping off of something that was never great to begin with. You know, so in that regard, temp scores are, are, are kind of a bad thing. But you know, but if you record, if you record, if you um, 
create a really great temp score, then you're going to get a better score out of it, you know. Um, uh, but yeah, I mean, it's, they can really limit the, the potential and the imagination of a film if, if a composer's brought in just to rip off a temp score, you know. And it, and it it's all depends on the composer, too, and that relationship with, with the composer-editor relationship. Really, so, well, yes, composer-editor and composer-director relationship, because um, some composers would definitely have a story, um, a sense of story, and, and, um, and quite an opinion as to why they should divert from the temp score and why the temp score is wrong. But a lot of composers won't because you know, they're new and they, they, they don't want to get fired and they want to they want to get through the process and get a film under the belt and so they're just going to do it, you know, and th they'll just copy the temp score um, even though it was never the best thing to do. So um, and they'll be afraid to to to, to say, hey, this isn't right. <laughs> so, so or they may not know. Some some composers are are better storytellers than other composers, you know. Yeah. But you you sound like you have a great relationship with your composer. No, no. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Although you know, it's funny though. When I, I, I when I temp a movie, I do such a good temp, I'm intimidated by it, and so I, I it, it freaks me out because I'm like, oh my god, I have to top this because I really, um, I really want to show the studio pretty much, you know, this is the score, the kind of score I'm going to write, but then I have to do better than that, you know. Mm. Um, but it's interesting. I, I, I've told the story. I'll just add this to the to the temp score thing if you have the time. Sure. Um, it's that um, you know there's this misconception that because I'm a composer that when I'm editing a film, I will uh, temp with music as I'm cutting, and I don't do that at all. Actually, I I want to watch a dry two-hour movie with no music, and um, because I feel like that when you try to sell a scene with temp music, you are inevitably prolonging the discovery of a problem that you're masking um, you know you know six months later you're going to realize that scene really didn't work the way you thought because you were fooling yourself into thinking it was working by putting that temp score in there so what I like to do is is watch the whole film dry which I've had the um, the, the I've been able to do that. Not that editor, every editor is able to do this, but I've been I had the blessing of doing this with when I was working with Brian. So I I could do that, and so then I then I realized I can confront the problems face on and solve them now, and not have them blow up my face later. And then when I then when I create the temp score, I'm doing it from I'm doing it from scratch for the whole movie, um, and, and and so I'd be able to, I'm, be, I'm able to sort of have it you know, have a design to it and have themes come in and out and have it breathe and, and not be constantly hacked up. Because if you, if you cut to a movie with temp music in it right away, you're going to be constantly hacking it through a Cuisinart. But so by the time you have your two-hour cut together, the temp score is just, is just garbage sauce, you know. Hmm. So yeah. anyway, that's that's what I do. But it, it really is a crazy way of doing it because, um, uh, not a crazy way, but it's, it's, a, it's a unique way that people are surprised that when they come in and watch long sequences that, I, that I've done bef before I'm done cutting the film, and they're like, wow, there's no music on this movie. That's really ballsy. I'm like, well, that's what I like to do. <laughs> you know? And also, I love doing sound design. So to me, the, my favorite thing to do is, is after I cut a scene is to do the sound stuff and, 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 that, and the think about the music later. So as a question for, for you as a composer, how soon do you start writing the music to the movie? You know, is, is it... When you read the script, is it when you watch a rough cut? It can be any any one of those things. I mean, I've I've thought of themes reading a script and then hoping that when I see the movie, it'll actually still work for it. Because sometimes you know you have these things in your head and you see the realities. But um, so I've done that before, and then other times that you're not hired until you know they're already shooting or halfway through shooting or done shooting, you know, or you're, or you're replacing someone else's music. So it really depends on when you're brought in. Um, uh, and then I'm old school, so I, I have to write all of my themes out before I even write the score. Where I think, you know, other guys might just start just diving into writing, but I, to me I'm lost. I don't know where I'm going, where I'm coming from, unless um, I, I go through the discipline of sitting there and writing my themes out, and then um, I think a better score comes from it. But it is a discipline because you want to dive in and start writing, and you have to really sit there and just write these full-fledged pieces of music first without picture, um, and um, it's agonizing. But to me, it, it pays off hugely because once I have um, those themes and motifs worked out in my head, you know, what character has this theme or what the broader theme of the movie is. Um, when I'm writing the score, it just, it just, the writing is so much easier and much, much faster. You know, back in the day, you know, Simon, my brother Simon and I, we grew up on film scores. I mean, I remember my first score I bought was uh, Back to the Future 2 with Alan Silvestri 
and then mm-hmm. Batman and Star Trek Two. You know, um, back then people who listened and loved film scores were considered an outsider, like the nerds. And yeah. today, though, it, there's such a resurgence all of a sudden of film scores, and it's become so much more popular. Why do you think that th- that's changed? I don't know. I think maybe video games have something to do with it because um, the music is more noticeable only because you have these these moments of where you're not really engaged in the, in the in the the game, but the music's playing, you know. And I think that maybe has uh, brought a lot of attention to it. Um, I guess I I don't know what I, what what the other reason would be. Um, I just wish the scores were better on films these days that people were so enthused about them because, yeah. um, you know, in the, in, the t- in the days you're talking about, composers will actually write the themes with beginning, middle, and end, you know, and um, now they're basically, uh, I call them you know, like theme fragments, you know, there's a there's barely a theme and that gets repeated, you know, and, and a lot of that is born from, from filmmaking itself. We don't have long vista shots like, you know, Dances with Wolves or Out of Africa for composer even to write anything these days that has a beginning, middle, and end. But um, uh, I think there's a lot of composers out there that didn't now have not grown up with those full-fledged themes that were written out. And when they're asked to write a full theme, they don't know what to do. You know, it's like there's no development, you know. I mean, if you know Star Trek, the motion picture theme, you know, it goes... It goes da 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 right? That's the A part. And then the B part goes... Da dee da 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 dee da da right, and then back to the A part. Da da da, and no, it's like, and you don't even hear that being done in major films anymore. There's no, it's basically all you hear is da 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 da. That's the entire theme. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> you know, exactly. Like, oh, like, dude, even if if you even if you're never going to use the full theme in the film, I I like to have written it at least. You know that that there's a full theme for the movie that maybe was never used in its full iteration, but at least I was drawing from it. You know. But I just come from that school, you know, where Williams would always write full-fledged themes, whether they were ever in their full iteration of the film or not, you know. You know, that, that's one thing I really appreciate about your scores. Um, even for movies like X-Men or, or sci-fi movie or fantasy film, your scores actually sound like a score. You know, it doesn't sound like what you were talking about, where it's just Thanks. pieces here and there. Thanks you know, for noticing. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, like I said, we, we've grown up with, with them, you know, the great James Horner, uh, John Williams, you know. Yeah. And it's just, it's an extra treat when you hear a fle- full-fledged score, an actual score in a film. It just brings it to a, to a whole new level. Thanks. Well, I hope I can write more of them someday. I've been in editing jail for a year. <laughs> <laughs> so which, which do you favor more, editing or composing? Oh, I love writing film scores. I mean, I, editing is, is a horrible thing to do to a human being. I mean, th- this, was an, this was an exception because I was inspired by something I knew was going to be good, but it's really difficult when you're, you know, cutting a film like, you know, X-Men Apocalypse, which, which is not a bad film, but it's not a great movie because the script wasn't terrific, and, you know, and so you're, you're and there was casting choices that were never, I was never going to overcome, and so... Um, in that regard, editing is just can be just a, a horrible existence, you know, if you're not constantly kept enthused by something. Um, um, whereas the music, you know, you can be in and out of a film in eight weeks, twelve weeks, you know, and and you can kill yourself on it, but you can either move on to something new and fresh um, and not be on the same thing the whole time, or you can just take a vacation, you know. So. Um, yeah, I really like writing film scores. I mean, it's weird, though, but when I go off and I haven't edited a film for a long time and I'm just scoring films, then I do get that itch to be a filmmaker again because I'm really am much higher on the totem pole when I'm the editor. But um, So then I start editing a film, but then I'm like, fuck this after about three weeks. So <laughs> <laughs> I have another year to go on this. <laughs> so. Being locked in a room for a year? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I want to thank everyone for sending in their questions. And... Um, before we go, is there any any suggestions for those listening out there who are looking at editing or composing as a film career? Be careful of the things you wish for. <laughs> no, I mean I always I always say this to everyone, and it's it's uh, people have told me that they find it useful, but even though it's like the most obvious trite advice, and I wrote an actually an essay on it because people always always ask this question. It's you can find it somewhere on my website. But it's called, it's called, I think it's called Do, 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 um, D-O, D-O, D-O. And it's like, it's basically do everything that, 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 that you can do. Um, uh, whereas 
you know, even if it's a piece of shit little film, do it, you know, um, if, or if, or if um, you want to be a film editor, but like, in, or, or you want to be a film director, like in my case, but someone asks you to edit their movie, just do it. Um, because you, if you hold out for that one thing that you want to do, um, you may never, you know, d be able to do that thing, but, but if you actually do something other than what you had planned, it might ironically take you full circle back to what you wanted to do. In my case, you know, I'd forgotten that I actually wanted to be a director, and then because of my editing and my music, and and from uh, because Sony Pictures kind of saw what I do with Brian, they offered me Urban Legends too, and I'm like, wow! I mean, they wanted me to direct a movie out of the blue, and which I and so you just never know where things are going to lead. So, but if you limit yourself by just not doing everything that, that that's out there, then 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 you are. You know, you're limiting self, yourself to, to a path that might open up for you. So, uh, you know, and also, it also, um, by having that, that, that attitude, it keeps you from, it keeps you having a good attitude. Because, you know, uh, if you, if you agree for, like in my case, to write music for some crappy little, 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 little movie early in my career, you know, where someone's brother's uncle, sister's aunt was a was a was a uh, a produ was a producer who saw it. You know, and, and if they hadn't seen that thing you did, you wouldn't have been hired to the other thing. You know, and so you can look back. Well, if I hadn't have done that little dumb thing, I wouldn't have um, made it. Also, it gives you an I guess I forgot my whole point. It gives you an attitude about not having an attitude about the things you're working on. That like you're going to make it better. You're going to take the shitty little film, and you're going to make it better with your music. Or you're going to you're, you're going to you're going to take this shitty script, and you're going to really make it work with the way you edit it or whatever. You know. Um, so and then, so it, it teaches you how to have a good attitude throughout the rest of your career. Because even today, I get cra I get a crappy film to score, but I have to make myself believe that I'm going to transform that movie. And I'm going to make a really good movie out of it. You know. And you know, there has been cases where. I really feel I was successful in raising the bar on a particular movie. I still watch it like a year later on cable and realize it was still a shitty film, but I made it better. You know, so. Yeah. Well, I, I one of my favorite uh, scores from you is um, uh, the score of Valkyrie. Valkyrie. That was just uh, yeah. a b beautiful score. Thank you. Well, you have good taste. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> your, your first uh, film was, uh, was it Public Access with Brian? That was our first feature film, yeah. And then it was Usual Suspects, correct? Right, correct. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Man, did you ever think that that movie would catapult both you guys? No, oh, no because I'm a half glass empty person. So I, I was like, okay, I was completely shocked at one <coughs> Sundance, and then it's like, well, I, I I knew we'd get some attention, but I remember I remember specifically. I remember standing next to Chris McCory, who was a writer on that public access movie, who had, of course ended up writing Usual Suspects. And um, he looked at me and he goes, well, that's it. And, they go, and I go, what do you mean? He goes, well, we made it. I go, what are you talking about? We just won this little Sundance. So he goes, no, this is it. We're on our way. I'm like, like what? Because Chris is super confident. Chris is like this person who's like, just he walks into a room and everything will be fine. And, uh, you know, and it, it, he's totally opposite um, personality as <laughs> me in that regard. So... Total surreal experience. Yeah, well, yeah. All right. Well, we are out of time. Again, I want to thank you for taking the time out of your uh, schedule talking with us today. Uh, guys, go see it. Bohemian Rhapsody. It's a, just a wonderful, <laughs> fun, beautiful film. Go see it now. And, yeah, go see it twice, three times. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and, a good, and a good loud theater. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I'll have to say we saw this in uh, Dolby Prime and Dolby Atmos theater, and it was yeah. just amazing. Cool. Um, yeah. Yeah. So again, it was great talking with you, and you. we'll have to do this again sometime. Yeah. Hope there's a reason to. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, only if you don't give up on film. <laughs> yeah, I know that's true. <laughs> All yeah. right. Okay. Well, we will end this here, and again, uh, hope we can talk again sometime in your next film. And uh, and Thanks. and you have a great vacation and take care. Thank you. All right. Thanks a lot. Good talking sure. to you.